There's a new movement of young, childless men getting vasectomies, reported being very or extremely concerned about the carbon footprint of procreation. Jacques-Yves Cousteau, the French ocean explorer, he thought that we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. The hopeful alternative to the extinction of millions of species of plants and animals is the voluntary extinction of one species, Homo sapiens. Us. When every human chooses to stop breeding, Earth's biosphere will be allowed to return to its former glory. And all remaining creatures will be free to live, die, evolve. Clearly, Ratzinger's concern about the importance of the doctrine of creation is justifiable. Okay, it is past seven o'clock, all is well, and uh, good evening, and welcome to Catholic Pacific College, and the first CPC3 lecture of our spring semester. I'm your host, Scott Roy, and it's wonderful to have you all here with us as we enter into not just a new year and a new semester, but a new series of lectures based upon the theme of creation. These CPC3 lectures, for those of you who haven't been here before, are a way for us to include the greater community into the life and learning of our college. I encourage you to invite others to come out and see and experience more than just a lecture, um, more than just fellowship, though certainly there are these things, but to experience Christ, Christ in the pursuit of truth, goodness, and beauty. We meet him here, though some may see it as a merely intellectual or academic exercise, but it isn't. Dr. Kaitler is fond of saying theology must be done on the knees, and I pray that we can all receive these lectures in the same posture. If not physically, then let our spirits hold a posture of prayer. These truths we pursue with our mind, we ponder them in the manner of Our Lady, and in order that we may comprehend beauty and goodness contained within them to enact them in our lives. So the three of uh, CPC3 lectures has to do with theology, tradition, and our times. Or we might say theology, tradition, and today. A theme like creation has much to do with all three, even if it may seem to have more to do with the past rather than the present. Now, and here I'm, I'm kind of just going to stir the pot a little bit, getting you prepared for the lecture. A question immediately arises. How can pouring over the traditions and teachings regarding creation, a seemingly past event, affect this present moment? Well, I'm not going to answer that, Dr. K will, but I suspect that how we approach that question has a direct correlation to how we live our lives, how we live our faith. This is, in fact, one of the aims and claims of Dr. Kaitler's lecture this evening, that it counters the present culture of death. In the preface to his book, In the Beginning, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger writes, The human threat to all living things, which is being spoken of everywhere these days, has given a new urgency to the theme of creation. Paradoxically, however, the creation account is noticeably and nearly completely absent from catechesis, preaching, and even theology. The creation narratives go unmentioned. It is asking too much to expect anyone to speak of them. However, tonight we are expecting someone to speak of them. We're expecting Dr. Kaitler to do just that. Um, Dr. Kaitler grew up in the Lower Mainland as an evangelical. He received a BA in Christianity and Culture from Trinity Western University, as well as his MA in Religion, Culture, and Ethics. Andrew brought his family to Lithuania, where he taught philosophy, theology, and more at LCC International University. 
And afterwards, he worked on his PhD in systematic theology at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And it was there, in the land of the fiery reformer John Knox, that Andrew and his family were received into the Catholic Church, a conversion process that began at Trinity almost 20 years earlier. It is with great pleasure and anticipation that I invite, invite Catholic Pacific College's academic dean, Dr. Andrew Caitler, to come and lecture for us this evening. All right. Um, this lecture tonight, so, well, it's a great privilege for me to be able to give it here. And, uh, and Scott stole some of my thunder by even quoting a quote I provide in my paper. Um, but, you know, this paper is, it has fomented for a while and it's seen a number of forms. And I, I, I think I sort of owe it as a shout out to where I presented these papers before. The first version I, I gave in um, England at St. Mary's College, Oscott, in England. Um, I got to go to the chapel there where John Henry Newman preached one of his famous spring homilies. And I tell you that the people at my symposium were not listening to me in the same rapt attention as those that attended Newman's talk. But uh, I think it went over all right. Um, it was, I was asked to present on Ratzinger's Theology of Creation in the Eucharist. Uh, and, and, sorry, Ratzinger's and Alexander Schmemann, so two thinkers. And then when I put the paper together, I realized I couldn't cover it all. So I just, I just did Ratzinger. And then I was invited to give um, the paper again, but a modified version in Austria, in Vienna, at a wonderful place called Step. Um, it's all in German, but the translation is it's the Scientific Center for East and West Studies. And here Orthodox and Catholics live together, pray together, and study together. A profound beacon of ecumenical hope. I ask you to please check them out, pray for them. Um, and now this is the third attempt at this paper. So, you know, three times lucky or something. Or three strikes and you're out. I'm not sure which, which way it goes. And um, if you would like a more dense version, there will be um, coming out with New Black Friars uh, a, a piece, uh, uh, um, an article. And it's titled, It is Good for Us to Be Here. So, and you could kind of put that as one of the many subtitles for this paper. It is good for us to be here. <coughs> All right, so let me begin. Ratzinger's theology is thoroughly Christocentric, meaning Christ is at the center of everything he, he does. And the center of his Christocentrism is the resurrection. He argues, quote, that the Christian faith all gathers around one key sentence, Jesus has risen. While the incarnation is vitally important on its own, it is incomplete. The incarnation can only be properly understood retrospectively in light of the resurrection. Without the resurrection, Christ would no longer be the criterion and the incarnation would not be a doctrine. All Christian theology, argues Ratzinger, if it is to be true to its origin, must be first and foremost, a theology of resurrection. The incarnational aspect is not erased with it, but is assumed in the resurrection. And therefore the resurrection is not an event that hangs in midair, but is rooted in creation, rooted in the cosmos. By reading creation in light of the resurrected Christ, it becomes clear that creation leads into the Eucharist and that the Eucharist elevates rather than elides the doctrine of creation. The world, set out accordingly, is radically anthropocentric. This is not pre-Copernican geocentrism, nor is it post-Copernican heliocentrism, albeit it is sun-centered, just not S-U-N, but S-O-N. The world is Christ or is Christocentric, Christ-centered. The Logos is the ground of all being. All things were created through and for him. In what follows, I will set out, I'll get go all over the place here a bit, but I will set out Ratzinger's conception of this anthropocentric cosmos, or more aptly, this Christocentric cosmos, by looking at how creation was made through him and for him. In the process, I will counter the naturalist movement, anti-natalism. 
Paradoxically, antinatalism, which I'll explain in a little bit, is parasitic on the doctrine of creation. And yet at the same time, it has to deny creation. A robust Christocentric doctrine of creation affirms both the human person and the natural world within which he or she lives. Antinatalism is a theological problem. Lastly, I'll look at how we as creatures participate in him through the Eucharist. In him, we are in the process of an ongoing creation. Creation and redemption go hand in hand. All right. Well, it's always appropriate to start with a little scripture. Here's from St. Paul, Colossians. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. What a beautiful piece of scripture. Okay, so all things were created through him. In him, all things hold together. In this passage, St. Paul gives us the metaphysical element of creation. And this, along with a number of other scriptural accounts of creation, is key for making sense of the natural world. Despite these rich metaphysical passages of scripture, Ratzinger notes that the doctrine of creation has practically been abandoned in modern theology. And where it is addressed, it takes up a reductionist position. It is reduced to a mythical or apocalyptic formula. And as a result, creation loses its original meaning. At best, creation is reinterpreted in an existential manner. But with such an existential reduction of the creation theme, there occurs a huge, if not a total, loss of the reality of the faith, whose God no longer has anything to do with matter. Many, many of the ethical issues that we presently face, including environmental issues, arise out of a Weltanschauung, or Lebenswelt. Good German words. They always have these wonderful words. Weltanschauung, worldview. I don't like the word worldview. Lebensfeld is a nicer word. Life world, because it incorporates your sort of whole being, not just your abstractions. Um, so, so, but worldview makes sense, because we all understand that. So, we, we arising out of this Weltanschauung, out of this worldview, or this, we could say this worldview arises because we don't have a doctrine of creation and its concomitant order of being. Ratzinger acutely notes that the human threat to all living things, which is being spoken of everywhere these days, and this is a quote that, that Scott just read, has given a new urgency to the theme of creation. Paradoxically, however, the creation account is noticeably and nearly completely absent from catechesis, preaching, and even theology. Okay. Rejection of creation. Antinatalism. Examples that provide context to Ratzinger's concern about a lack of creation or doctrine of creation abound. Two years ago, Nell Frizzle published an article in British Vogue asking, Is having a baby in 2021 pure environmental vandalism? In line with this, there's a new movement of young childless men getting vasectomies. Ten urologists across the United States told the New York Times that they have seen a notable uptick in bookings for the procedure this summer, especially among younger, child-free men, whose resolve to not produce appears to have sharpened in the face of a precarious economy, worsening climate change, and a more restrictive family planning landscape. In Australia, between 2020 and 2021, 
there's been close to a 20% increase in the number of childless men under 30 requesting vasectomies. A doctor in Australia told SBS News uh, this very fact. Now, National Review noted that a 2020 study in the journal Climactic Change found that 60% of U.S. respondents between the ages of 27 and 45 reported being very or extremely concerned about the carbon footprint of procreation. And 96.5% of respondents were very or extremely concerned about the well-being of their existing expected or hypothetical children in a climate changed world. In the same article, the author highlighted Jacques-Yves Cousteau, the French ocean explorer, who, quote, called the idea that suffering and disease might be eliminated, and this is now his words, not altogether a beneficial one. He thought that we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. Continuing in this vein is the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, VHEMT. On the unabashedly quirky VHEMT website is the following self-description. Um, and, and it is very, very uh, quirky their website. They kind of laugh at themselves, but it's very disturbing. Uh, as VHEMT volunteers know, the hopeful alternative to the extinction of millions of species of plants and animals is the voluntary extinction of one species, Homo sapiens, us. Each time another one of us decides to not add another one of us to the burgeoning billions already squatting on this ravaged planet, Another ray of hope shines through the gloom. When every human chooses to stop breeding, Earth's biosphere will be allowed to return to its former glory, and all remaining creatures will be free to live, die, evolve. Clearly, Ratzinger's concern about the importance of the doctrine of creation is justifiable. The world is Logos-like. Genesis 1, 1 through 31, sets before the reader an orderly account of creation in which everything is intentionally brought forth and affirmed by God. And it was good. Creation reaches its apex with the creation of the human person. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Only the human person bears God's own image. And with the closing of the chapter, we read, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a sixth day. The creation account given in Genesis is Logos-like. It has order, meaning, significance. And it counters what Ratzinger refers to as our original experience. Our original experience is polytheistic, according to Ratzinger. We see that there are forces and counterforces, powers in conflict with one another, some of which we need to protect ourselves against, others on which we can rely for help. The world appears as a chaotic and threatening place, and this is an experience we share with our forefathers and our contemporaries. In contrast, the author of Genesis claimed that the world is not a confusing jumble of powers standing in opposition to one another. Rather, there's only one from whose, from whose will all these things come, and that will is a good will. The story of creation liberates man from the fear of the gods and fear of the world. The world, contrary to initial appearances, is rational. It exists through him who is the Logos. 
Okay, and of course, you know, when I say the word logos, you go back to the prologue in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word, right? That's the word logos. And logos doesn't just mean word, it means reason, the type of rationality, meaning. It's very complex. Ironically, it's only within a framework of creation that the anti-human, anti-natalists can rationally take up their position. On the one hand, the world must be reasonable if they're going to make their claims. On the other hand, in order to make judgments about what should and should not be done, human reason must correlate with the reason of the world. Such judgments require two things. We understand the world, and two, we have a conception of what is good. In terms of the first requirement, Ratzinger writes, Faith is reasonable. The reasonableness that exists in creation is derived from divine reason. There is no other truly convincing explanation. Further expanded, and in more Thomistic terms, Joseph Pieper writes the following, Reality in itself is oriented towards man's perceiving mind without the mind's contribution and simply by virtue of its very being which man has not bestowed on it. Moreover, the human mind, in turn, is ordered toward the realm of existing things, also not by its own doing, but by virtue of its very being, which again is not its own creation." This orientation of the human mind toward reality precedes any of the mind's own choices and decisions. A finite mind is, in its essence, geared toward the knowledge of reality. Man, by his very nature, is related to the world in truth. Reality itself is relational. All being is known by God. Therefore, truth and being go together. Put differently, a thing cannot have being without having truth because all things are in relation to a knowing mind, the mind of God, the Creator. Knowing is an act of transcending the self by incorporating the other into one's self. And the world is made as knowable, for it is rooted in the Logos. And we are made to participate in the knowability of the world through our own Logoi, our own mini-Logos. All-knowing, all-knowing is recognition, recognizing, rethinking the divine thought. My Logos participates in the Logos to rethink objective reality. Arguably, Ratzinger writes, oh, sorry, this isn't Ratzinger, this is a guy named Rohner, writes, if our mind were not by its nature already in touch with reality, it would never be able to touch, to reach reality at all. All right, that's pretty heady stuff. Moving on. And it was good. The second thing needed for judgment is a conception of the good. Again, there must be a metaphysic. The Logos-like quality of the cosmos from which my Logos is attuned opens the door to the empirical sciences. But if there is to be ethical judgment and the upholding of human dignity, This is a door that cannot as yet be closed. To close the door here, when we just talk about the world being orderly in a Logos manner, would be what Ratzinger calls the way of Galileo, a reversion to the mathematical side of Platonic thought. With Galileo's approach, God is seen as the mathematical principle in nature, expressed succinctly 
by Galileo as God does geometry. Which is kind of good, because I don't. Um, Okay, Uh, for Galileo, nature replaces creation. The knowledge of God is turned into the knowledge of the mathematical structures of nature. As a result, God dwindles away and becomes a mere first cause. The God who satisfies a hypothesis, but does not reach out to meet us. Here, subject and object are separated, and the subject becomes irrelevant. Creation only implies an ordered material cosmos, and God, as subject, disappears into the ether of abstract thought. With the erosion of the supreme subject, God, so too is the subject man alighted. Man is reduced to an object, as C.S. Lewis would say, a trousered ape. To remove Christ, the God who acts, loves, and reveals, is to diminish the human person. Whereas Galileo curtails God to the geometric, Martin Luther keeps the personal God, but curses creation. In puritanical zeal, Luther exercises Greek thought from Christianity. Metaphysics, he argues, is the product of the human intellect, not the divine intellect. Radically corrupted and depraved because of the fall, the human intellect cannot proceed toward truth. For Luther, the doctrine of creation is where this influence of Greek thought made its way into Christianity, where you see it most. The language of being, of cosmic order, and so forth. All of these are sort of like curse words for for Luther. Ratzinger writes, For Luther, the cosmos, or more correctly, being as such, is an expression of everything that is proper to human beings, the burden of their past, their shackles and chains, their damnation. Law, ooh, that's a bad word for Luther, right? Because you get the dialectic, right? It's the gospel law dialectic. So all you get with this is law. Redemption can take place only when humankind is liberated from the chains of the past, from the shackles of being. Redemption sets humans free from the curse of of the existing creation, which Luther feels is the characteristic burden of humankind. Grace, in Luther's framework, is in radical opposition to creation. And it's an attempt, Ratzinger says, to get behind creation. Within Galileo's framework, man loses his dignity. With Luther, the world loses its dignity. We can take this one step further. Ratzinger is clear that salvation is not an individualistic affair. Man is not a person as a solitary creature. Rather, he's a creature who, as a person, is a relation. An I, thou, we. Part of the we, of the I, thou, we, is creation, including history and culture. The human person cannot be removed... Oh, I think I went too far, didn't I? Let's go back. There we go. The human person cannot be removed from these contextual aspects and still be a human person. Hence, Ratzinger argues that redemption cannot happen without or against creation. In stripping away creation, Luther inadvertently strips away the human person. There we go. I always tell my students I really admire Marx's beard. Um, But but that's the only nice thing I'm going to say about him tonight. (laughs) Working within the framework established by Galileo and Luther is Karl Marx. 
And there's sort of a long history here. It goes, I mean, Hegel precedes him, uh, the great philosopher, but Marx is, is a, a disciple of Hegel. So Marx continues the assault upon the human subject by similarly rejecting creation. Like Luther, Marx separates redemption from creation. Redemption is now construed strictly, writes Ratzinger, as the praxis of man, as the denial of creation, indeed as the total antithesis to faith in creation. According to Marx, we should not inquire into our origin. We don't want to know where we came from. That doesn't matter. What matters has no relation to what is. Rather, what matters is feasibility. We're, we're going through this in my, one of my classes right now, and, and we get given this great Latin for, uh, word or phrase, which I'd like to quiz my students that are here, but I won't put you on the spot. Verum quia faciendum, right? What well, truth is feasibility. Truth is progress for Marx. For Marx, our origin, because of its Logos-like structure, implies dependence, contingency, and limits, and thereby shackles progress. Thus, Marx shifts the focus from the past to the future and conceives of a totally malleable reality. Nature is to be bent and conformed to the future we create for ourselves. Returning to the human person, in Marxism, the individual person is robbed of her personal reality and reduced to an aggregate within the species. What matters is not the forming of persons toward a given personal telos or end, but the molding of the species toward an invented end, an end not informed by nature nor by metaphysics. Individual persons are either part of the plan and fit within the aggregate, or they are a hindrance. And we know what that looked like in the USSR. Stalin killing up to 75 million of his own people. Ratzinger asserts, the decisive option underlying all the thought of Karl Marx is ultimately a protest against the dependence that creation signifies, the hatred of life as we encounter it. Again, the loss of the sense of creation along with its concomitant, the divine subject, the creator, inevitably leads to a reality in which human dignity and personhood is eroded. The Marxist notion of truth and feasibility, although you know, it seems like a long time ago, actually fits very well within our own present Weltanschauung, our own uh, worldview. Scientism, the technological paradigm. Within the natural sciences, nature is only a category. Notions of human rights and human nature is overlooked or downright rejected. We exist within a morally ambiguous society because physical chemical structures do not show us how we ought to live. The only thing that such structures reveal are the limits of feasibility. Henceforth, the moral and the feasible are identical. This is just the continuation of Marxism. So go throw away your smartphones. Uh, nature simply provides an explanatory framework for behavioral research. And this approach has had a profound influence on contemporary culture. So, for example, one I love to use in class uh, that was published in BBC Future, there's an article. And, and in fact, um, you, I don't think you can get it on the website anymore. They took it down. But the title of the, this article in BBC was called The Reasons Humans Started Kissing. Great title, right? Kind of intriguing. The author answers the question with a simple response. And I mean, I know you all know this, of course, already, because it's the whole point is so that women could get close enough and smell their potential sex mates pheromones, right? That's why we all kiss, yeah? I mean, we're not all kissing each other. I mean, why you kissed your mate and all the rest, right? To smell them, 
to ensure the health and fitness of the child that may be conceived. While such reductive narratives may contain elements of truth, the determinism of these naturalistic explanations are incompatible with experience. Most of one's social life is actually taken up with decision-making, not instinctually, blindly following an instinct. In nervous trepidation, I chose, out of love, to kiss my bride-to-be. Now, she's not here right now to con- con- you know, confirm what I'm saying or not, but I'm fairly certain that she did not instinctually respond in order to smell my pheromones. <laughs> Behavioral research calls human decision-making artificiality, an alternative to what is natural. The ambiguity of these terms says much. Artificiality is the quality of being made by humans rather than occurring naturally. Or, if you look these up in in the dictionary, is defined as the quality of being contrived or false. If decision-making follows the first definition, it requires a theology of creation. Without it, there's only impersonal matter. Deprived of a theology of creation, we come to the latter definition. Ratzinger points to Jean-Paul Sartre as the embodiment of this position. According to Sartre, we're damned by our own freedom, a freedom in which there's utterly no reason to make one decision over another. All decisions are contrived. With great precision, Ratzinger claims, if creation cannot be recognized as a metaphysical middle term between nature and artificiality, then the plunge into nothingness is unavoidable. Creation provides the storyboard within which each person's narrative can be written. It provides a direction, an ought to our context. Without it, the human person is either a mere bundle of instincts in which there is no I, or the person is sickened with Sartrean nausea by the abyss of meaninglessness. The anti-natalist movement collapses in on itself if it does not have a theology of creation. If there is no grain to the universe, then there is nothing to go against. Everything is nature, therefore nothing is natural. While the anti-natalist movement needs a theology of creation in order to make judgments about what is good, namely the moral claim that the world is better off without humans, It is the very doctrine of creation that elevates the human person and stands athwart antinatalism. From Galileo to Luther to Marx, we have seen the link between creation and anthropology in the negative. If there is no absolute good creator who, as divine subject, transcends us and creates a Logos-like world, the human person is reduced to a trousered ape. Now, written almost 40 years ago, Ratzinger summarized what he referred to as the anti-human position, but fits just as well for the anti-natalist position, which is anti-human, and he summarized it in the following way. This would be the attitude that sees mankind as a disruptive agent that wrecks everything and says that human beings are the true pest, the true disease of nature. He argues that this is feigned humility. The antinatalists are going against creation by positioning themselves above the creator, as if they know better than omniscience. And in turn, rather than healing the world, we end up destroying both ourselves and creation. We deprive it of the hope that lies within it and the greatness to which it is called for it awaits the revealing of the children of God, as Romans 8 tells us. Effectively, the anti-natalist considers humans to be unnatural. Thus, humans must be healed of being human. They must be bereft of mind and freedom if they are to fit within nature and their existence to be justified. 
According to Ratzinger, what motivates this extreme view is the antinatalist's inability, and I think it's so insightful, to accept him or herself. With great insight, Ratzinger posits that the root of human happiness is self-acceptance. And the human person can only accept herself if she is first accepted by another. He writes, Only when life is accepted and found accepted does it become acceptable. Man is that remarkable creature who needs not only physical birth, but approval in order to exist. It's good that we are here. Each human person must be told that it is good that she exists. The primary affirmation that is given by the lover. The affirmation, however, must be based on truth. Otherwise, the beloved will curse the love that keeps her in place through a lie. Ratzinger concludes that the apparently simple act to like the self, to be okay with the self, actually raises the question of the whole universe. Creation is necessary for our own self-acceptance. Until the antinatalist recognizes creation, she will be incapable of loving herself, incapable of affirming her own being. Antinatalism is an expression of self-hate. It is comparable to G.K. Chesterton's conception of suicide, but the inverse. Chesterton writes, The man who kills himself kills all men. As far as he, con- he is concerned, he wipes out the world. Whereas the antinatalist seeks to wipe out the world in order to kill himself. All right. Moving to a more positive note. Grace presupposes nature. The antinatalist claim is a theological claim. Ratzinger contends that there is also, however, a theological concealment of the concept of creation. Here, nature is undermined for the sake of grace. It is robbed of its belongings and gives way, so to speak, before grace. And this is most clearly seen in Protestant reform thought in which to be human is to be selfish, to be depraved. Salvation, then, is to be rescued from our humanness, something akin to the Reformed doctrine of human depravity, minus the hope of imputed righteousness, undergirds antinatalism. In contrast to Reformed theology, Ratzinger calls attention to 1 Corinthians 15.46. It is not the spiritual which is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. Creation and redemption are intertwined. Ratzinger pithily states, the doctrine of creation is based on the doctrine, sorry, the doctrine of redemption is based on the doctrine of creation, on an irrevocable yes to creation. The essential reason is that only if the being of creation is good, only if trust is in being is fundamentally justified, are humans at all redeemable? Only if the Redeemer is also Creator can He really be Redeemer. That is why the question of what we do is decided, decided by the ground of what we are. The higher only stands with the lower. Another quote from Ratzinger. Man is the creature who is capable of being an expression of God himself. Man is so made that God can enter into union with him. Man who seems at first sight to be a kind of unfortunate monster produced by evolution at the same time represents the highest possibility the created order can attain. Antinatalism perceives man as a foreign virus that has infiltrated the natural world. The telos of man, the end of man, is the destruction of the world. Counter to this, Christ, as man fully realized, reveals that our true end is deification, not destruction. We were created for him, for God. 
Man does not completely find himself except in Christ, except in becoming an alter Christus, a little Christ, another Christ. Man is the highest possibility the created order can attain because he can pray and self-consciously and purposely commune with God. In philosophical prose, Ratzinger writes, and I don't think I have this quote up here. Um, no, I don't. Matter is what is, and I won't read you the German, I'll just give you the English trans- translation, is that which is thrown upon itself. And spirit is that which throws itself forth guides itself or designs itself is itself in transcending itself we as humans our body and spirit we transcend ourselves in our acts of selflessness in love and in worship and we're never more ourselves than when we do all proper relationships require the transcending of the self yet what we are created for extends beyond our wildest imaginings. As we all have heard this many times, I assume, St. Athanasius, Irenaeus said something similar, said that God became man in order that man may become God. Our humanness, which the antinatalist wants to rid in the name of nature, can, in love and freedom, participate in the life of God. Theosis, of becoming sons and daughters of God, is not the destruction of our human nature, but its elevation. Ratzinger presses the point by using evolutionary language to speak about the resurrection and its implications. Jesus' resurrection, he writes, was about breaking out into an entirely new form of life, into a life that is no longer subject to the law of dying and becoming, but lies beyond it. A life that opens up a new dimension of human existence. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is not an isolated event that we could set aside as something limited to the past, but it constitutes an evolutionary leap. The evolutionary leap occurs on another level of existence on which love was no longer subject to bios, to the biological, but made use of it. Grace perfects nature, extends nature. Okay, talking about nature and extending our human nature, what is it? Well, I'll do that very shortly, don't worry. This won't be, we won't have to sit here for another two weeks. How does man image God? As set out, man is matter and spirit, is one who transcends himself. And this is tied to relationships. This is the core of Trinitarian theology. God himself is relation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father transcends himself, so to speak, by giving everything to the Son. And the Son, through the Spirit, gives everything back to the Father. Man, as the Imago Dei, as the image of God, images God not simply in his rationality and freedom, but in his relationality. Man only fully comes to himself in relation. Ratzinger theoretically asks, Is not creation actually waiting for this last and highest evolutionary leap? For the union of the finite with the infinite? for the union of man and God, for the conquest of death? By being united with God, who is infinite relation, the human person becomes uber-relational, or super-relational, and thereby, (coughs) excuse me, becomes fully, becomes fully herself. Now I'm going to give you a really long quotation. And, It's much nicer to read along with me. So here you go. And this is Ratzinger again. The Rubicon of becoming man, of hominization, was first crossed by the step from animal to logos, from mere life to mind. Man came into existence out of the clay at the moment when a creature was no longer merely there, but over and above just being there and and filling his needs, was aware of the whole. But this step through which logos, understanding, mind, 
first came into this world is only completed when the Logos itself, the whole creative meaning, and man merge into each other. Man's full harmonization presupposes God, God's becoming man. It is openness to the whole, to the infinite, that makes man complete. Man is man by reaching out infinitely beyond himself, and he is consequently more of a man the less less enclosed he is in himself, the less limited he is. For, let me repeat, that man is most fully man, indeed the true man, who is most unlimited, who not only has contact with the infinite, the infinite being, but is one with him, Jesus Christ. In him, harmonization has truly reached its goal. Man was made for God. Man was made to be completed in Christ. In the resurrected Christ, man is deified. In Christ, the true ubermensch, the superman, is formed. Man is resurrected beyond the biological to live within the life of God himself. While it is a natural extension, harmonization reaches its goal only in and through Christ. It is not an extension that our nature can reach on its own. Along with the language of an evolutionary leap, Ratzinger suggests that in Christ's resurrection, an ontological leap occurred, one that touches being as such, opening up a dimension that affects us all creating for all of us a new space of life, a new space of being in union with God. The ontological leap, while fitting for our relational nature, is nonetheless a leap so great that only one who is fully God and fully man can complete it. In him. Ratzinger writes, Here, talking about the Last Supper, the new worship is established that brings the temple sacrifices to an end. God is glorified in word, but in a word that took flesh in Jesus. A word that, by means of this body, which is now passed through death, is able to draw in the whole man, the whole of mankind, thus heralding the beginning of the new creation. The God-man leaped the abyss that we in our finitude cannot. He leaped it for us, uniting humanity with God. We join into this by participating in the life of Christ and becoming new creation. And this leads us to the Eucharist, which is the way of communion with and for all things. The Eucharist is Christ himself. We all eat the same person, not only the same thing. We all are in this way taken out of our closed individual persons and placed inside another greater one. We're all assimilated into Christ. And so by means of communion with Christ, united among ourselves, rendered the same one sole thing in him, members of one another. Christ redeems us through human means, namely a feast. And in a human way, we must freely partake and open ourselves to the thou that presents himself through the we of the church and the blessed sacrament. Grace presupposes nature. Speaking of nature, according to Ratzinger, the Eucharistic mystery is fulfilled as follows. Not only the transformation of bread and wine, but our transformation and the transformation of the world into a living host. How is the world transformed into a living host? By means of us. By means of us, the transformed who have become one body, one spirit which gives life, the entire creation must be transformed. The cosmos is Eucharistic. The first step is for man to become Eucharistia, And then through man the world is brought into its proper state of thanksgiving. Man is the crown of creation, as both the apogee and as the one who will draw the cosmos into the divine life. 
Hence, the cosmos is anthropocentric. It finds the fulfillment of itself through man, and man through Christ, the true man. The cosmos is Christocentric. Why does it find its fulfillment through man? Because to man belongs not only his fellow man, to man belongs also the world. Hence, if man as such and as a whole is to be brought into salvation, then the delightful mystery of things must also be preserved for him. All the instruments that God has created must join in, as it were, to the symphony of joy if there is to be full harmony. To save man without the cosmos is not to save him. Likewise, to save the cosmos without man is not to save the cosmos. Man is a cosmic creature, and Christ redeems us and it as such. It is only in thinking back with Christ through the resurrection that we can understand creation. Now, in this talk, I set out the argument chronologically, so to speak, beginning with creation and ending with the Eucharist. Yet, theologically speaking, these claims could only be made in light of the Eucharist, the sacrament in which we partake of the resurrected one. The Eucharist reveals that creation, as seen in Genesis, is a move toward the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the sign of the covenant between God and man. It sums up the inward essence of the covenant. If this is so, oh, I think I have this quote up here. Um, If this is so, creation exists to be a place for the covenant that God wants to make with man. The goal of creation is the covenant, the love story of God and man. This is why the church fathers say that the church preceded creation in the mind of God. Because the whole point of creation was for the church, for covenant, for relationship. This relationship, writes Ratzinger, is two-sided. And from our side, it means worshiping God. What exactly is worship? Worship is the surrendering of the self to God, which consists of the, human, the union of humankind and creation with God. Creation moves toward covenant, and this is fulfilled when we become worshiping creatures, when we are deified. Covenant does not stand opposed to creation, and man's deification does not involve his destruction, a la Luther, but rather his fulfillment. In other words, as the good shepherd Christ enters in the historical fray of creation and pushes the ontological process initiated with creation further along toward the goal, deification or the spiritualization of matter. The incarnate, resurrected God-man unites all things in the Eucharist. He is the ultimate affirmation of the natural world and its final end. In him and through him we are made royal priests who as fellow creatures gather and offer all creation to the Father, enabling creation to become Eucharistia. Creation and redemption go hand in hand. This is the total counter-narrative to antinatalism. In a twisted way, antinatalism is correct, that it is only in death that life will be preserved and creation will be beautiful. However, it's not death in terms of human extinction that is the answer. Rather, it is to die and rise in Christ. An extension, not an extinction of life. Now let me conclude. All right. Antinatalism is a disturbing reminder of the importance of the doctrine of creation. Its fundamental assertions are at odds with the doctrine of creation, and yet, ironically, to be rationally grounded, it requires a doctrine of creation. Ratzinger provides a nuanced Christocentric theology of creation that weaves together creation and redemption, metaphysics and theology. In so doing, He makes clear that humans are not a foreign plague within the cosmos, but are the means of creation's fulfillment. Creation is for covenant. The cosmos ceases to be a cosmos without human persons, and it is through humans that the cosmos reaches its final Eucharistic end. Likewise, humans will only reach their final end with the cosmos to which they are intimately related. 
Now, it is fitting to conclude with a final image that is related to the Genesis creation narrative. The Genesis account of creation is written as a foil to the Enuma Elish, uh, a, a Near Eastern myth. According to the Enuma Elish, the world arose out of a struggle between opposing forces and found its final form when the god of light, Marduk, split in two the body of the primordial dragon. One half of the dragon's corpse became the heavens and the other the earth. From the blood of the slain dragon, Marduk created man. Ratzinger writes, These were not all just fantastic tales, but experiences in the form of images that the world is actually the body of a dragon. And man has dragon's blood in him. There's something sinister lurking at the bottom of the world. Deep inside man lies something rebellious, something demonic, something evil. Ah, but Israelite religion countered. The world comes from the mind of a good God who created all things and created all things good. Man comes from the earth and lives through the breath of God. He is a relational creature, communio personaro. Eve is taken from the side of Adam. It takes communion for there to be a creature known as man and not killing. The human person is created from and for relationship. The human creature comes, so to speak, from the side of another human creature. And this is taken up and elevated to new heights with the pierced side of the crucified Christ. Echoing Genesis, in which Eve is taken from the side of man, the open side, the pierced side of the new Adam, repeats the mystery of the open side of man at creation. It is the beginning of a new, definitive community of men with one another, a community symbolized here by blood and water in which John points to the basic Christian sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, and through them to the church as the sign of the new community of men. This new man does not have dragon's blood cursing through his veins. Rather, he has Christ's blood. Because of creation, perfected and extended in Christ, we can take up St. Peter's words at the transfiguration, which echo anew that of Genesis. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Thank you.